Hey, if you brought a Bible this morning, open it up to Romans chapter 1. In fact, just kind of get comfortable in Romans because we're going to be uh, uh, at Romans 1 a couple of times and we're going to dance around the book of Romans today. Really, really important. While you're finding the book of Romans, shouldn't be too hard. Uh, Pastor Brandon already mentioned it, but let me just encourage all of you, just because I'm super uh, enthused about it, I've had a Mother's Day message brewing in me for months, something I feel like the Lord was saying, uh, and so I don't want you to miss it. It, it, As Pastor Brandon said, it's kind of going to be in the same flow of what we're talking about as we move into the next part of this mini-series uh, on I've Got Questions, we're going to talk about relationships. How do you navigate relationships in this postmodern world where all the definitions have changed and the conversations are canceled now and anything other than affirming people is not allowed? How, how do you do that from a biblical perspective? And we're going to look at that, and I really want to begin that on Mother's Day and talk about why mama bears are more important now than they've ever been. And I'm going I'm to take it from the Bible. I'm not being playful. I'm telling you, this stuff is legit, and we're going to see what the Word of God says. So that's Mother's Day. Well, we are in the final message in this collection of studies we've called I've Got Questions. And the first part of the collection uh, has about four parts. And we've gone through, uh, Pastor Brandon started us off and talked about what in the world's going on. Did a phenomenal job connecting the dots between what 1 Timothy chapter 4 warns us about, that in the last days, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons would just infest the earth, would perpetuate all these different versions and different definitions, all in an attempt to confuse people, to overwhelm people, and mostly to lead them away from Christ. And he did a great job connecting those dots so we could see practically. Well, the next thing we looked at was, can I really trust the Bible? Lots of question marks about, you know, how, how, how many, many people wrote it and is it God's really, really God's word? And Pastor Brandon just took us down uh, an excellent scriptural and an excellent uh, uh, pathway to understand it's not just the inspired word of God, but it is such a profound historical and archaeological work that the only way you cannot validate that is you have to intentionally ignore overwhelming evidence and you have to intentionally choose to suppress the, suppress the truth. Then last week, we, we asked a question, so where did this whole thing begin? And we looked all the way through the Bible, cover to cover, boldly and unapologetically, introduces God is the eternal creator, and he's the sovereign sustainer of all life. And last week, we ended up in Romans chapter 1 that talked about the fact that if you're not willing to acknowledge that, then what happens is something gets jilted in your thinking. You, you, you can no longer process rationally and, re, and, and with reason like, like, you, like you were designed to do, but instead you begin opening up and you become vulnerable to all different kinds of thoughts, all different kinds of approaches, most of them that will compromise your integrity, that will begin to chip away subtly at who you really want to be and who God's called you to be. And eventually, if you let that thing slide long enough, it'll lead you into foolish thinking. And we saw that was from the Greek word morano, which means you, you, you can act, actually think you're super smart, but what's coming out of your mouth is just moronic. That's like, an, that's imbecile, that's buffoonish stuff. It's like that, the, are you listening to yourself? It doesn't even make sense. And we're looking all over the Bible. This is happening in the word of God uh, right now. It's happening in our news. We don't have to stretch to say, how in the world? No, it's actually happening. If you missed any of those, then I just encourage you, go and get it online, go to our podcast because uh, they're, they're meaty teachings and they're well worth it. Well, as I was studying for last week and this week, I came across a quote and it's by a man named General William Booth, who started the Salvation Army, who I, I, I didn't know this, but interestingly, somebody told me he looks almost like a twin to one of the people on Lord of the Rings. So if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you'll know who it is. I didn't recognize that. But in any case, he was asked at the end of the 19th century, so this would be the late 1800s, 19th century, he was asked, what do you think in particular will challenge the church in the 20th century? So that would be in the 1900s, which are now behind us. And this is what he responded with modernism in the 18, late 1800s, just taking, kind of taking hold. He responded this way. He said, the chief dangers I see will be religion without the Holy Spirit, 
Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Now, he passed away in 1912 at the age of 83, but time has proven this guy nailed it. I mean, to the point that I think he would even be shocked at just how far things have progressed away from, uh, from the belief in God, including the belief in the Bible doctrine of heaven and hell. Well, that brings us to today's study. Today, we're going to talk about how will it all end? And I ask you to turn to Romans chapter 1. We're going to read just a couple of verses to get our thinking going in a, in a direction. And then I'll, I'll kind of narrow it down and focus us in today. Romans chapter 1 starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, not the men themselves, but the ungodliness and the unrighteousness that have taken root and are being demonstrated and lived out by these men. And here's how, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what be made, may be made known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. That, that's not a tongue twister. That's not a play on words. His invisible attributes are clearly seeing and notice being understood. So they're understood by the things that are made even to the point of his eternal power and the Godhead. So that when the whole thing is summed up, these people are without excuse. They can give you a bunch of their reasons and rationales, but from, a God, from God's perspective, these people are absolutely without excuse. Now, here's what's interesting. In, uh, in the 2020, the, one of the latest stats that were taken, it says 70% of the people in the United States still believe in the existence of heaven, but only 60% believe in hell. And so here's the decision that we made on our study because we have such a higher percentage of people that believe in heaven and because that's kind of more of a pleasant subject to discuss, we're intentionally not going to deal with heaven, although it's a worthy topic, but we're going to assume that either you're in or you're close to the 70% that believe that heaven's an actual place. But here's the other reason why we're, we're gonna focus more on hell today, because of the 60% of the people that believe in hell, that's a deceiving number. They do believe in hell, but they don't believe in the traditional version of hell that, that we see find in the Bible. In fact, in an article from, 19, uh, from, so 19, from 2021, uh, in the International or Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, uh, C.P. Rangel, a professor at St. Louis University, uh, published an article just entitled Hell. And in that, he outlined five alternative views to the traditional model of hell where people who commit sin are eternally punished. And I want to point out that what, he, what, what I'm about to briefly go over with you is part of the 60%. So when we say 60% still believe in hell, that includes these people right here. And here's, here's the five views, super brief, right? Number one, uh, actually number one and two, are, it's called a psychological view of hell. And that is that hell's not a physical place, it's a state of consciousness where, where the damned experience psychological suffering range, ranging from mild to harsh. So super disappointed to actually being tormented and those have two different theories that, that come with themselves and there's a, a large group of people that actually believe this and they study this. Here's a second uh, version, is an annihilationist version. And they believe that after death, the damned simply cease to exist. So their punishment is not, they're, they're not able to enjoy life moving forward, whatever that means to them. A large percentage of these people believe in reincarnation. And so you keep coming back over and over, but if you end up in this category, it stops and you don't get to keep experiencing and enjoying life. Here's a third one, and this was my favorite, by the way, and I say that tongue in cheek, the free will view. You can almost make up anything, right, in the free will view. But the free will is that God places the damned in hell not to punish them, 
but to honor the choice they freely made to not be part of heaven and not join themselves to God. In this view, hell is not so much divine justice as it's a measure of divine love. And here's the fifth one, the universalist view, that all people will eventually end up with God in heaven. In essence, then, there's not really a hell it's, there's just a temporary place where people further evolve until they reach a place of perfection that they can finally be with God. Now, you're like, how, well, where do they get this stuff from? How in the world can they come up with this? I'm telling you, these are legit, le legitimate advanced degree studies that people are writing books about and, and teaching classes about, and tons of people are, are flocking to it. And I'll tell you why. Because when you look at this postmodern view that focuses on the immediate experience of every individual, and a large percentage of is that, that they want to make sure that every single person is only affirmed and no one's ever, ever offended, for you to even try to mention the Bible's doctrine of hell, that is just mind-numbingly offensive. And depending on the discussion you're in, that's actually labeled hate speech. Now, that would be one thing if we're talking about people that are outside of the church, right? But we've been kind of tugging on, on a thread throughout this whole series how this stuff's even in the church. In fact, when Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3, he was writing to the church. So he was saying, hey, pay attention because this is going to create a drift. Some of you, and the word some's not just a couple, it's a pretty large growing number. Some of you, if you're not careful, will drift away from the faith. And so it's not surprising that we have social gospel and we have all kinds of denominations. One large one that just met yesterday to, to allow oh, almost 200 churches in North Carolina and South Carolina to lead the denomination because of disagreements over biblical, traditional biblical doctrine. And so it, it shouldn't surprise us, but some parts of the church even now look at the doctrine of hell and they say, ah, that's just irrational. That's harsh. That's extremely old fashioned. That's excessively insensitive to those who are listening to this on their spiritual journey, just trying to live out their truth. You can hear that postmodern thinking, that applied postmodernism that Pastor Brandon introduced to us and helped us to understand what's going on. But then you have the people that still say, nope, we're going to accept that the Bible's you know, definition that, heart, that hell is a real place. However, if we think about the penalty for sin that the, the Bible seems to indicate that that's an eternal punishment, that just seems shockingly unfair. In fact, how in the world can a loving God punish somebody for eternity for sins that were committed in such a temporary time here on this planet. And, and if you, listen, if you'll entertain any of those alternative views, here's what begins to happen, and you can measure it in yourself. Either consciously or subconsciously, you start downplaying sin and the weightiness, the heinousness of sin in your own life, and you certainly do it in the lives of those that you love. Because for you to come to grips with how clear and how distinct the Bible is about sins, about things that, that are absolutely wrong, abhorrent to God, things that will put people on a track to never experience life in heaven in the, in the ever after, for you to think about yourself like that, well, you, you'll look for a way to give yourself reason and rationale, but especially those that you love, you can't bear to think that your children, that your spouse, that your family members, that close friends will, might experience this, and so you'll start wiggling and you'll start looking. And, and so we're finding that this is happening all over the place. But, but here's what's interesting. Even when you give yourself that wiggle room and you say, no, come on, loving God, it, it can't be all that, and you start listening to you know, little compromises and little adds to the doctrine, little, little uh, subtractions to the doctrine, here's what's interesting, that you'll still, though, reserve the right to embrace a Bible doctrine for those particular people that you think are exceptionally vile, like serial killers or serial rapists or child molesters or, or terrorists or those in that category, right? You may actually say to yourself or you'll hear somebody else say it and you won't disagree, I hope they burn in hell forever. And you won't disagree. 
Because somehow you've got this, this, this place in your mind where, it, where, where you've reserved a judgment, you've reserved a category and said, well, I certainly don't fit in that category. And the people that I love don't fit in that category, but what do we recognize? There are some people throughout history, his, you know, Hitler, and, and they, they fit in that category, and they deserve that. But it's interesting and even ironic, when you take that position, you're trading places with God, who is the ultimate judge of the earth, and you're stepping into a level of pride that, steps, that, that, that puts your own goodness above what God's prescribed, and you yourself then are so prejudiced that you're now sinning and denying the word of God. It's just a cycle of deception when we just don't let the Bible tell us what to do. So let me just kind of lay some things clear, and then we're going to unpack some stuff this morning. The Bible is clear at every point on all accounts that sin at every level is grievous to an eternal God and therefore punishable by eternal death. Now that, we're going to see this super plain today. In fact, it's so grievous that starting in Genesis chapter 3, just the picking of a piece of fruit and the biting into an apple was enough for God to begin to design a redemptive plan that would eventually compel Christ to the cross, which one scholar said illustrates the fact that God literally hates sin to death. He has no tolerance for it at all. But not only that, we find out from the Bible that hell is absolutely a real place. In fact, just as real as heaven. It, it's, it's so amazing to me when I meet somebody and they are an advocate you know, of heaven, of everlasting life, but they question everlasting punishment. But the Bible speaks about it in the same terms of reality. In fact, we might even tip the scales towards hell in, in verification because Jesus actually talked about hell more than he did in heaven. And the reason can, can be easily understood because Jesus understood the magnitude of depravity that comes in when you even let a little bit of compromise sneak into your life. Let me read you a couple of samples. You don't have to turn to these. But Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, no one is righteous, not even one person. Think about every person that's ever lived in the history of the world. No one is righteous, not even one person. Well, Jesus would be the exception, but remember, he was eternal God who wrapped himself in flesh so that he could fix this problem for us. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. And so when we see that, we, we have to keep this thing framed in because when we begin to understand how true the Bible is and how clear the Bible is, then we can also realize it doesn't matter how popular the theory, it doesn't matter how large the mass of culture begins to lean and rationalize and justify. Listen to me, there's no measure of rejection, there's no measure of, re of revision that will alter the Bible's doctrine of hell, not even a little bit. It won't make it go away. It won't reduce sin's penalty, and it certainly won't mitigate the intensity of punishment that the Bible talks about. This is real, and this is eternal. In fact, it's so eternal that you then begin to understand. It, it's so intense that you then begin to realize why God went to such great lengths so that nobody ever has to experience anything like that ever. But instead, they, they can live with him in heaven forever. Well, we're going to set three goals, and we're going to get started here. Uh, three biblical perspectives. Number one, we're going to ask the question, is hell a real place? And we're going to see from the Bible, it absolutely is. Number two, how does a loving God send someone to hell? That one will take a, a minute or two to kind of look at because we've got to adjust some, some definitions and, and some mindsets that have evolved in culture. And then here's the third one we'll end up with. How is eternity in hell a fair punishment for sin committed here on earth? And if you'll just listen to the Bible, by the time we're done, this is going to actually make sense. It will appeal not just to your spirit, but it will appeal to your reason and your rationale. It's like, no, when you lay it out the way the Bible does, that actually makes sense. And so we're going to get started. Question number one, is hell a real place? 
And again, I've already said it, but the Bible is clear and it is explicit and it's repeated over and over that hell is a real place. It was designed for Satan and the fallen angels and his demons to be punished forever. And and it's inclusive of those who reject Jesus Christ here on earth to be sent after death. And so when you start looking at just scripture, you find out that this place of eternal punishment is graphically I mean graphically, like, like when you read it and you understand, if, if you were to put this on film, this would be one of those horror movies. Like you're watching, like I can't even watch this, and it is graphically described in scripture uh, in the following way. So uh, the reference is only gonna come up, we don't have time to go through it. I'm gonna grab a scripture or a few of them and give you some quick highlights, but listen, write these down or capture them, and you go study it for yourself, because I'm not embellishing, if anything, I'm being on the condensed side, and when you go look at it for yourself, you're going to watch it really open up. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 says that hell is a literal place of eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What you really have to understand there, it's not really intended for humans. In fact, in the same way that the Bible says that we're going to get an eternal body in order to live in that eternal place called heaven, because these temporary bodies just won't cut it. In the same way, people that, are, that, are, that go to hell will get an eternal body because these physical bodies will not be able to handle the level of intense punishment and torment forever, so they have to get bodies that can't die. They'll just feel like they're dying forever and ever. They'll wish for death. And so it was designed for supernatural beings, but, but, uh, but people will end up there. Verse 46 says that it's a place where the punishment of the wicked is never ending, is as never ending as the bliss of the righteous in heaven. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, and Mark chapter 9, verses 44 through 40, 49, says that it's a place where an unquenchable fire perpetually scorches the body of the dam. Literally, these people are burning alive forever. But they've got a body that will never completely burn out, and so they'll just feel that, that, that sensation. They'll feel that, that agony and that torment as if they're burning alive forever and ever. And not only that, but it also says that maggots will continue to eat away the rotting flesh as it rejuvenates so that it can be burned and scorched and rot all over again. Deuteronomy, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says it's a place of shame. And that particular word means deep, deep humiliation. Like think about some time where you've embarrassed yourself or you've done something, you're looking around like, hope nobody's filming that, I hope nobody's looking at that. Yeah, but the most intense shame and humiliation you can experience and everlasting disgrace, this word disgrace, we, we could easily substitute for self-loathing. Like you're just, I can't believe you're so stupid. You're so, I can't believe you did that. And you, you are just hating on yourself. Luke chapter 16, verse 23 through 24 says it's a place of agonizing torments and fire. And I want you to notice that torments is plural. That means there's more than one going on. This particular word for agonizing literally is taken from a word that they use for an instrument of torture that is designed to physically, mentally, and emotionally break a person down over time. And so literally, this is everlasting, that this, this, this torments, plural, all different kinds of suffering, they're gonna go on forever and ever, and, and yet there's no hope that you'll ever get broken down, that you'll ever make it stop, there is no relief, it'll keep going. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine, says it's a place of everlasting destruction. And this particular word literally means to be ruined. So here's what that means. You, you've probably been in situations before and you felt like the thing that you were trying to build suddenly begins to crumble. And you can see, man, this is it. Yeah, we, we can't hold it together. I mean, it's fragile, it's duct tape now, but it's coming apart at the seams. You're going to experience, well, not you, people are going to experience that in hell forever thinking that, well, you know, there's gotta be a bottom. There's nowhere to go but up. There will be no bottom. It just, you keep feeling like things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse perpetually. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 and 11 says, it's a place where eternal fire and brimstone. And this word brimstone literally describes a very thick sulfuric smoke that you know, happens in, in a chemical fire or happens like when lightning strikes a certain part of the earth, it's left with that chemical, that sulfuric residue. 
And it says that this is a place where, where fire and brimstone caused the smoke of torment to rise forever. And that word for smoke is talking about a thick, thick, dense smoke like you can't breathe. So people are like in the middle of, of, a, of a fire that's going on and the smoke is so thick, they can't catch their breath. So they've got the torment, they've got the self-loathing, they've got all stuff going on, but now they can't breathe. They, they feel like they're choking, just struggling, like they're suffocating to death because of this sulfuric smoke. Revelations chapter 20 kind of capitalizes on that and says that a lake of brimstone or this burning sulfur uh, it's a place that, uh, where, where the wicked are tormented day and night forever and ever. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 3 through 5, and Psalm 76, chapter 10, uh, verse 10, says it's a place where the condemned acknowledge the perfect justice of God and recognize their sin is the sole reason why they're there. So they finally sober up and they realize God's a just God. I'm here because of me. But listen to me. Here's where people begin to, to, you know, to assume things. And so they repent. No, no repentance. We don't have time to go into it because a whole nother part of a study. But in, in hell, people realize that God is just, that God is fair, that his word is true. But they're still laden down with all of these thoughts and these addictions and these, these desires and these, this anger and this resentment and this, this ego and everything. But now there's no rescue. Now the truth is gone. Now there's nothing to help them see the light. And so they get darker and darker and darker. So even though they recognize that they're there because of their own doing and their own sin, and it adds to their self-loathing, uh, self it adds to their despair, but they become even harder in their hearts. In fact, there are scriptures that talk about that people begin, begin uh, to intensify in whatever their, uh, whatever their, their, um, their, their passions were, their, their unhealthy passions. For example, if someone you know, is struggling with lust, when you get to heaven, you'll struggle with lust forever, or in, to hell, you'll struggle with lust at an intense level you've never understood, only there will be no relief. You can't do anything to relieve that even for a moment. It's going to be more and more and more. Same thing with ambition, same thing with ego, same thing with greed, same thing with adultery. It doesn't matter what, what the sin is, it becomes harder and more worse. So, so to sum this up quickly, the Bible leaves no room for doubts. Hell is a real place. And hell is forever. And hell is a place of inconceivable torment that will go on forever and ever. And again, this is why God does everything he can to say, please, please don't choose that option. Please accept Jesus' sacrifice and miss all of that. And let me bring you to a place that is also inconceivable in the goodness and the blessing and the wonderfulness that you, can, that you ever thought you could experience. Here's question number two then. If that's the case, and hell is like that bad, then how can a loving God send someone to hell? And in order for us to address this, we, we gotta unscramble a couple of definitions that we've gotten all goofed up, especially in the last 10 years. Um, and we've gotta also correct some assumptions that go along with it. So here's the first thing. When we say, uh, how can a loving God send someone to hell? We have to come back and say, well, what, what does the Bible say about a loving God? Because to the culture, a loving God is someone who's non-confrontational, someone who just wants people to feel accepted, who just wants people to feel understood, who, who just wants people, you know, to kind of keep moving forward in the journey and not get stuck or not go backwards. And by the way, certainly all of those things are part of the character heart of God. But the world's definition of that kind of love is a God that's more concerned with people's temporary happiness than they are with their actual well-being and certainly than they are with, with all of eternity. But that's not the Bible kind of love. The, the, the Bible kind of love then turns and, and, and describes it this way. It starts in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, when the Bible just boldly and unapologetically uh, proclaims, God is love. Now, that's, that's not to be understood like humans where we possess love and you say, well, boy, they're, they're sure are a loving person. They sure are a nurturing person. That's not the same thing. The Bible says God literally is love. In other words, he's the very definition of love. He's the pattern that marks what all real love looks like. He's the perfect expression about how love demonstrates itself. And, and, and I'm gonna pull in, you know, some... Uh, because the modernism uses, tries to use this stuff, the, there's, there's three fundamental laws 
uh, of logic or uh, uh, of interpretation. And they're used in any field of study, uh, uh, of literary studies or analytical studies, but that includes Bible interpretation. And one, one of those laws is called the law of non-contradiction. And here's what it says, something cannot be both true and untrue at the same time. Well, that seems common sense, but it's literally a law of interpretation. And so if we take that to the Bible and we say, well, if the Bible says that God is love, then the law of, of non-contradiction would, would say, then it's impossible for God who is love to do ev- anything that's unloving. That those contradict each other. It can't, can't be there. So when we come back and say the idea of allowing people to go to hell is an unloving act by God, not only is it a Bible misconception, but it's also a gross mischaracterization of God and of the Bible's definition of love. And, and it, again, if a person argues with that or thinks otherwise then what they're doing is they're putting themselves in a place where they say, well, God's not loving in that case. I'm more loving than God there because I see a disparity. I wouldn't take that approach. And by doing that, again, they are replacing themselves as the judge and the jury rather than letting God do that. Thereby, they're sinning themselves, rejecting God's word. Now, Now, these are logic, rational terms, right? And they're not the way we always think. But you need to at least hear him and let him, you know, bounce or at least settle on the inside so that when you're then out in the world and you're hearing somebody talk in a panel or you're seeing some news report and somebody's giving their version of something, something ought to register and you'd be like, that's not right. That doesn't make any sense. In fact, I think that's a violation of the law of non-contradiction. You can't say this and that at the same time. Pick one of those and I'm willing to hear you out. But you can't trade horses right in the middle of a thought. But I'm telling you, this is happening all the time. All the time, this is happening. So, then, then the first step to answer the question, how can a loving God send someone to hell, is to first agree with the Bible. Well, we know that God is love. And so, we don't understand it maybe at this point. We don't know how we feel about it. But we know that everything God does is an expression of, of that perfect love. And then we can move to the second misconception here and, and ask the question, well, then does a loving God actually send people to hell? And the problem here is the way we use the word send. Because there's a, there's a few different word, ways that you can use it. And the way we tend, tend to use it is like someone sends a letter or someone sends a gift. When we're using it that way, then the person who's sending the gift or sending the letter is the one taking all the action. The letter and the gift, well, they're just passive participants. They didn't have any choice. They're sitting on a shelf. Somebody grabs them, sticks them in the Amazon box, and shoves them off to somewhere else. And so that, that's a way of sin, right? But that's not true with anything we see in the Bible between God and people. God's not this arbitrary judge saying you're going to go to hell and you're going to go to hell. Ah, I'm kind of in a bad mood today. I think you're going to hell as well. He's not making those arbitrary decisions and people are just kind of, you know, crossing their fingers and shaking in their boots, hoping that God will overlook or God will give them the wave to go on to heaven. That's not what's going on. The Bible doesn't validate that at all. In fact, the Bible says that God's given every person who ever lived on the face of the earth the freedom to make their own life choices. And part of those freedom of choices leads up to where you will spend eternity. That's completely up to every individual. God sets the standards. God says, here's what life looks like by his design as the creator and the owner and the sovereign sustainer of all of it, as the holy, pure, righteous God and righteous judge of the universe. God sets the game board and the rules, and then he says, okay, you get to make choices about how you're going to move move through this. In fact, let me give you some of these. John chapter 3, starting in verse 16, we usually start and stop there, but I'm just going to keep reading. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For or because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. 
Romans chapter 10, starting in verse number nine, it says, but what does it say? And that's the scriptures. God's word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek in the context here. He's talking about the Jews believing, uh, being God's believing people and the Greeks being people that are not saved. All right? He says there's no distinction between those two. Uh, I lost my place. Oh, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever, whether Jew or Greek, believer or unbeliever, calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. The last one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, or working in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you, we're begging you. On Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he who made him, uh, for he who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Does that sound to anybody like God's trying to send people to hell? He's trying everything he can to not do that, to provide a whole nother option. And by the way, he's not even saying, yeah, he's not imputing all of your sins. He's not saying, well, you did this and this and this, so you crossed that line, so now you have to go and and you get out. He's not doing that. All of those, you know, those stories, hey, two guys walked up to heaven and they talked to St. Peter. None of those are true, by the way. None of those are even remotely hinting, right? It's not really about the sins, plural, It's not about bad habits and addictions and patterns and and thoughts. And it's not about any of that. Nobody will go to hell because of those things. There's only one reason why a person would go to hell. They reject the payment that Jesus offers to wipe all the slate clean and to be able to go to heaven by grace and alone, by the mercy and grace of God alone. Nobody gets to brag in heaven and say, "You, you know why I'm here? Yeah. Same reason why everybody else is here. Because Jesus paid a debt that you couldn't possibly pay off. That's the only reason. And so it's important that we begin to understand that. But the way that people will ask the question, why well, I just don't understand how a loving God can send someone to hell, it, read the way, it reads in a way that implies that the people in hell are just passive recipients of God's impending judgment. That somehow they didn't deserve, they, I mean, they were good people. They did more good stuff than bad stuff, and somehow they deserved to, to be in heaven, to not be in hell. But listen to me, nothing is farther from the Bible truth. In fact, if you want to reframe the question, if somebody asks you that, say, well, let me, let me reframe that question for you, okay? If you're asking me if the God of love, uh, if, if you're asking me why some people go to hell if God is a God of love, then I can give you some answers for that. And one of them is right here in Romans chapter one. I asked you to turn there. We read it over, but let's go back and I wanna point a few things out. Romans chapter one, I'm in verse number 18 now. It says, for the wrath of God is, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Just so you can understand the two, ungodliness are literal sins against God. That's sins you make in the heart and you decide, I am not going to accept God's word. Or I know what God's word says, but I'm going to rebel against the truth. Or I just don't have a, a, a reverence for, for the word of God, for the spirit of God. I have kind of a casual you know, attitude toward, more of a religious attitude. It says God's wrath is revealed against that. But not only that, the unrighteousness of men. And this is talking about the sins that are committed against other people because of your wrong thinking and your wrong sharing, passing along, perpetuating thoughts and, and ideas and philosophies and information and including your wrong behavior. And, and one of those behaviors he's going to zero in on next, he said, who suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. 
And that word suppress literally means to intentionally grab something and hold it down, kind of stuff it down as hard as you can and then put all your weight on it so it can never bubble up to the surface. In other words, this is not people that are just, you know, they, they're, just, they, they're just not connecting all the dots. We're talking about people who know what's true, but because other truths and other preferences and other goals and other things that they, they'd really want to see, they're justifying, they're rationalizing. Well, I, at some point I will, but I just got to get this done first. Listen, I'm doing all this for, and they'll you know, usually put somebody else because it makes them feel like they're sac- self-sacrificing, but they don't put God in, in his rightful place. And the Bible says that, that there's a, it starts with an ungodliness, And then it moves to an unrighteous behavior. That ain't right. You shouldn't be living that way and you shouldn't be giving the example to other people that somehow it's okay to live that way. And he says, and what you're really doing is you're suppressing the truth in that unrighteousness. And he said, the reason God's angry is because what may be known of God is manifest in them. This is a phenomenal little tiny phrase in the Greek. And and really it's talking about the fact that something has been made clear and recognizable, but in this one it says it's manifest inside of them. It's talking about something's been made real on the inside. In fact, other translations talk about the inner conscience or a moral sense. In other words, God's wired in every single person the inner conscience, the moral sense. You, You may have to look backwards, but you remember the time when you're at these crossroads and inside of you, you know what to do, but you also know, yeah, but, but if I just kind of a little bit here, then look at the benefit I get, and you did the same thing Adam and Eve did. You picked the apple because something about it almost seemed irresistible, but your inner conscience told you, don't do that. Don't do that. And you rationalize, yeah, but you don't understand, you know, everybody, if I don't do this, you know, then, then I won't be able to compete and I, I won't be able to have what I want, you know. And listen, you, it was an inner conscious. And listen, God put that in every single one of us to give us a head start. But not only that, it goes on and says that it was manifest in, in them. It says, for God has shown it to them. This is the same Greek word, only this time it's externally focused. He says, not only did God put the inner conscience But God, you're going to see in just a minute, God wired creation so that every day it's flashing like a neon sign, like a neon sign. I'm not talking about just trees and sky and birds and the water. And I mean, those things, nature things are great, right? But I'm talking about the way that life unfolds and its complexity. I'm talking about those times when you don't expect it and all of a sudden something hits you and a lump comes up in your throat and you've got tears in your eyes and your emotions are gushing and you're doing everything you can to hold it down because something happened and you recognize the goodness of God. You recognize something is more beautiful. Something is worth, worth, worth fighting for. Something is bigger than anything you could ever produce. So God says, listen to me, I, I wired this in a moral code and I've got life every time you step out the door is flashing like a neon sign to prove to you who I am. And so the only choice you have is to accept that and lean in towards God or you can keep going about your own ungodliness and your own unrighteousness and you can keep stuffing that down and pushing it down and pushing it to the side to put your own goals and your own aspirations there. He said you can do that if you want. But he's going to tell us in just a minute. He says, but you can never use that as an excuse. Yeah, but the reason I didn't because I was just so busy. No. Nope. No. Nope. We'll never stand. It's not a valid excuse. So he goes on and he says that God manifested in them. He's shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even to the point of his eternal power. This is God's omnipotence. This is things that you step back and you say, only God could pull that off. Only, yeah, he does. And he does it on a regular basis, neon sign, flashing, flashing, internal, internal conscious, your moral sensors going off saying, man, God's real, God's real, God's real, God's real. And it goes on and says, and the Godhood, he's talking about the Trinity, not just some God that sits way on a throne, some old man that, you know, started wisdom, not just Jesus hanging on a cross, not just the Holy Spirit that we experience on a daily basis, nudging us and tugging at us or showing up in a worship service, a devotion time, all of them. All of them. 
and how they intricately fit in our life. In fact, Arthur and Pastor A.W. Tozier, he was thinking about and, and trying to describe this intimate connection with God that we see in Romans chapter one. And this is how he said it. He said, the yearning to know what, what cannot be known, to comprehend the incomprehensible, to touch and taste the unapproachable arises from the image of God in the nature of man. Deep calleth unto deep. And though polluted and landlocked by the mighty disaster theologians call the fall, the soul senses its origin and longs to return to its source. This is exactly what the Bible's talking about. God's wired. Nobody will stand in front of God and say, but I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, you did. You knew over and over and over and over again. But you chose and you say, well, why would they do that? Why would, well, Romans chapter 8 helps us. It says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. By the way, not talking about super, you know, sappy, mystical, spiritual people, Christians, versus people that are just more practical and productive. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the people that are willing to compromise the truths of eternity, the truths of this eternal God in order to accomplish or in order to have or to experience the things that are temporary, which by the way, their moral conscience and the neon sign is telling them, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But they risk, they gamble. Many of them knowing God's true, many of them saying, yeah, but it's just for a time, it's just for a season. But once I get to here, then I'm gonna be able to free it up too. And they rationalize all this stuff but they do it over and over and over again. It goes on and says, for to be carnally minded is death. And let me just stop. This is not saying to be evil minded. This word carnally minded is the word carne in the Greek where we get the word meat as in chili con carne. It just means to lean into your basic or your baser instincts, to not listen to that moral conscience to lean into the things that you want to do. Kind of like when you were two years old and you wanted ice cream for breakfast and mom said you can't do that. And you pitched a fit and you screamed and cried. And yeah, it's the same thing, only the adult version of that, right? We lean into those, but I want what I want and I want to do what I want to do. And the Bible says when you lean into that, then it says it is death. Proverbs nineteen twelve says, well, it leads to death. There's a way that seems like it's right, because that's what that person really wants to do. But it's gonna to lead to destruction every single time. It says carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Hold on, their choice. They're not submitting themselves to the Lord. They're not humbling themselves. They're doing what they want to do the way they want to do it, and everybody's wrong. In fact, Proverbs says that a person who isolates himself in this mentality will rage against all wise counsel. You have 100 people come tell, listen, you're, you're missing the point. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. They just don't understand, and they're going to stay with this. He says the carnal mind is enmity against God because it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it, it ever be. That particular mindset will never be. So here's what we find out, that though God put his truth in their heart, right in front of their eyes, people still choose to turn away, away from and, re, and refuse to accept it, basically because they want to live the way they want to live. This is a shocking quote I'm going to read you. But it's by American philosopher and atheist uh, Thomas Nagel. And he, he literally captured what, what the Bible says here. I don't think he was intending to, but here's what he said. He said, it isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God because I don't want the universe to be like that. Well, that, that's about as honest as you can be and, and understand what scripture says. You are intentionally perverting, intentionally suppressing the truth. Let me give you this last one real quick and I'm gonna have to speed, uh, speed give it to you. Question number three then, how is eternity in hell a fair punishment for sin committed here on the earth? And basically I'm gonna wrap it up this way. I won't have time to take you through everything. But there's three things you have to wrestle through. Number one, the problem of sin. Number two, the gravity of sin. And number three, God's divine justice. Well, if you study Romans chapter five, verses seven through 19, that will tell you that the problem of sin is widespread. 
the problem of sin is man's own desire. It started with, with Adam and Eve, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's perpetuating. And some people will say, well, that's not fair. How come that we, you know, we were born into sin, how come we, we get to be punished for Adam's, uh, for Adam's sin? But you'll find out through, through the word of God that that's not true because you'd like to take that position. Well, I'm suffering for what Adam did or I'm suffering for what Eve did. You know, I can't believe she ate the apple. Whoa, well, whoa, well, hold on for a second. Because this started early on before you were even cognitively able to make your own decisions. That sin showed up in your life. You screamed and cried and threw yourself on the floor to get your own way and your parents had to deal with that. But that hasn't stopped. You're still doing that in a much more sophisticated way. And the Bible says all over the Bible, listen, there's not any single one of us that, that are perfect. In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9, I'll read you this one scripture, says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And James chapter one will tell you that sin starts deep in the heart. And, and I'll just jump as a pastor, but also as a person. Let me just tell you. There are some of you right now that are wrestling with thoughts and wrestling with, with, with things that you'd like to do, maybe fantasies in your mind, and the only reason you haven't carried it out is because the consequences are scary. My point is, it's not because you have such a moral heart. It's not because your heart, without the, being submitted to God, is like, no, that, I, I can't think like that, that's right. Oh no, you've indulged that. Some of you would have, you'd, you'd have strangled people. You'd have beat them to a pulp. You'd have lit things on fire. You'd have committed adultery over and over and over again. The only thing that stopped you is because the consequences are, are so great. Hopefully, in a group of Christians, it's because the Holy Spirit convicted you and you came back and said, God, you, you, have, to, you have to clean my heart. You have to regenerate me. You have to renew my mind to the word of God. But there are a ton of people who they are just good. You know, it's like, no, no, no. Every single person, their heart is exceedingly wicked. You don't know what you would do if you would never be found out. If there would be no consequences without Christ, you, don't, you have no idea the extent of depravity that you would tumble down into. And the Bible's really, really clear about this. There's also the gravity of sin. And we see this in 2 Samuel chapter 11 where David sins with Bathsheba and then there's a pregnancy that results and then he tries to cover it up by having her husband Uriah killed so he could marry her and it looked like that was his baby and this went on for over a year and in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the prophet Nathan comes and says, you did that and David find, realizes he's caught and he confesses and then he writes a prayer of repentance in Psalm chapter 51 and in verse number four he says, God, I've sinned against you and you alone. And you're like, what? I read the story. I saw the movie. It wasn't against God alone. You sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against Uriah. And really, you sinned against the whole nation by trying to cover it up for a year and deceiving God's people. You sinned. Yeah, you sinned against God, all right. But see, David understood this, that the first and foremost sin was against an eternal God. And we tend to think that a little sin, because we think with a finite mind, that a little sin is just, well, we just did it that one time in that one, and let me tell you why we did it, because it was cra Every, anybody would have did that. It was crazy. Even, and we don't understand that one little sin in a moment of time to an eternal God becomes eternally offensive to him. That stays in front of him like a reel all the time because he doesn't live in time, he lives in eternity. And by the way, before you get frustrated by that, be excited about it. The fact that he does live in eternity, he's an eternal God, is why we get the opportunity to live eternally in heaven. It's not a temporary, it's not like you do this and you get a lifetime you know, of heaven but then you start all over again. No, 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 it's eternity. But that eternal offense in front of God means that in order for you to pay back, in order for you to wipe that slate clean, you'd have to go back in time and unsin. Well, you can't do it. And so God comes up with an eternal plan. And the eternal plan was to send his eternal son to pay the eternal price so that you and I could be eternally forgiven and we could stand eternally righteous in front of an eternal God. And that's exactly what he did. It was the most amazing thing. In fact, the Bible says that when God was creating, that God took his fingers and he flung out the stars and he dotted them here. We want, you know, this constellation and that constellation. He did all that with his fingers. It's figurative language, but it makes the point. But when God was designing salvation and pulling it off, the Bible said he rolled up his sleeve and he used his whole arm. 
because of the muscle, because of the magnitude of what needed to happen and the redemption he was trying to pay for his people. And so we talk about the gravity of sin. The gravity of sin is unimaginably, unimaginably be, uh, a weighty. You, you cannot possibly do it. Once you've made a mistake, that's it. You're no longer eternal perfect. And if the righteous judge of the earth lets somebody in who's imperfect, then he becomes an imperfect righteous judge. And this perfect place to all heaven is no longer perfect. It's a, it's a real dilemma. But I'm telling you that God loved us so much that he actually worked that out. And because of that, we find out that God's divine justice. And let me just kind of walk you down a quick trail. I'm going to close right here. So Romans chapter 1 tells us that God not only gives us his inner conscience so that we know instinctively, intuitively, we know where, where the kind of the lines between good and evil are. We might not know chapter and verse, but we know, ah, something's a little off, and yeah, we really should. I just felt, I just felt, like, felt bad about doing that, and we know the difference. But not only that, every time we open our eyes, it's a neon sign glowing everywhere, and God's teaching us and telling us, if you'll lean into me, if you'll move closer to me, I'll teach you some things. I'll show you some things. I'll, I'll come and, and make myself known to you. And so God gives us every single opportunity. And not only that, if and when we do mess up because we're imperfect people that are born into sin, we will. God says, that's okay. I got this figured out for you. I sent my eternal son to pay the eternal price so that you could have eternal forgiveness in front of an eternal judge and one day you can stand in front of him and you can be eternally wiped clean forever and ever and have entrance into eternal place called heaven. God said, I did all that for you. All you have to do is accept that. Now here's the amazing thing. Some people, even though all of that's in front of them, some people will say, no thank you. And when that happens, listen to me, it's not that this righteous judge is saying, okay, I'm so angry you did that, I'm sending you to hell. When that happens, all the weight and the penalty of the sin that they committed down here goes back on their shoulders and God says, okay, then you pay for it. I can't. Yep. So your, your, your punishment, your judgment is to spend all of eternity trying to pay for what you did because you can never pay for it. So you say, why would, why would a loving God do that? How is it fair that, that, uh, that, you know, the temporary sin on earth? Well, because it wasn't temporary, it was eternally offensive to God. And so you have to pay for it eternally unless you'll accept the eternal forgiveness and eternal salvation. It's literally that simple. And God goes to such great lengths because he so loved the world to say, listen, please, please, please accept the penalty that Jesus gave, and you can be washed clean, and I'll step into your life, and that inner conscience will begin to swell, and your eyes will begin to be open to how God's all around you moving all the time. You'll sense God tugging at you and nudging you. You'll have wisdom begin to come to you. God will do all of that because eternal life starts the moment you accept Jesus Christ. You stop suppressing truth, and you open up to truth. Then the eternal God comes into your life, and you begin to live eternal life here, and it just moves on into actual eternity and gets better and better and better. I would imagine there's three groups of people here because in every, you know, every gathering, whether it's just a few people, there's usually at least three groups, but I'm gonna focus them here. There's one group of you that you're listening to these things and your heart is weighing heavy because you have children, you have family members, you might have a spouse, you have close friends, and you know they're on the wrong side of that equation. And this is certain. And this is unimaginable. And your heart begins to break and then goes into a little panic. Like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Let me tell you something. Prayer is a powerful thing. And we're going to look at some of that in the next time. There's another group of people here that you're somewhere in that wrestling match. Maybe when I was talking about you would have already done these things if the consequences weren't too scary. You might say, ah, uh, this guy's reading my mail this morning. Listen to me. There's lots of people that wrestle through that. Listen, wrestling with sin is, is real. And if that's you this morning, I want you to know God's here to give you the power to overcome that. And then there might be somebody here and you've never accepted Jesus. You're on that spiritual journey trying to figure it out and some of these things just didn't make sense. Like how does a loving God send people to hell and why would people have to go to hell forever? And is hell even a real place? All those things are, are, are you know, kind of hindering you from making that decision. But if you're here this morning, one thing you can't deny is that that inner conscience, that Holy Spirit inside of you is talking to you. 
and you've, you've felt it before and you keep pushing it back. Well, maybe next, I just got to figure some things out. Listen to me. The reason the Bible says today's the day of salvation because eternity is serious and you don't have any promise of tomorrow. You woke up this morning by the grace of God. You're not guaranteed tomorrow or the next day. And you don't know at any moment when life will be over for you and you'll be in that eternal decision that was already made. But here the Holy Spirit is trying to get you to make it today. I'm going to pray for all three groups this morning. And then we're going to finish by all of us repeating a prayer. And if you're in any of those groups, listen to me. I want you to take heart because God's not sending anybody to anything other than trying to get everybody to come to heaven. And yield it, lean into that this morning and ask the Holy Spirit to come and help you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that as you're speaking to people today, that each of these groups and any of the ones in between that I didn't put in a category, Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. And you're the one to come lead us into all the truth right on into heaven so that we can experience the goodness and the greatness of this loving God. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give clarity and that you would give courage to anybody in any of these categories and who knows which what other ones to make the decisions they need to make today so that you can step in and you can move them into, their, into the blessing you've planned for them. Now all of us pray this together. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that you're the Son of God. I know that you died on the cross. I know that you rose again. And I know that God's offering me forgiveness eternal life I accept that today new, fresh in a very real way come close to me Holy Spirit blow all the confusion and the question marks out of my brain and help me to see you with fresh and clear eyes teach me how to serve you in Jesus name